yo, yo creo que el ideal de la frontera, de esta relación que hay entre México y Estados Unidos, es muy estrecha, incluso entre sociedades, entre ambos países. Les comparto que el 49% de los mexicanos tienen familiares aquí en Estados Unidos y 15% de ellos tiene eh, población, el 15% de la población recibe remesas. Actualmente hay 35 millones de personas de origen mexicano en los Estados Unidos, de las cuales 16 son nacidos en México. Hoy en día hay un millón de estadounidenses en territorio mexicano, que lo que es considerado como el grupo de ciudadanos más grande que vive fuera de su país. La actividad económica es fundamental y esto queda reflejado precisamente por este intercambio comercial que asciende a 507 billones de dólares, esto equivale a un dólar por minuto. Tan importante es este comercio binacional que 25 de los 50 estados de la Unión Americana tienen a México como el primer y segundo socio y se generan 6 millones de trabajos que dependen del comercio con México. La confianza de los empresarios de los Estados Unidos es parte fundamental en estas relaciones. Prueba de ello es que del periodo de 1999 a 2013, las inversiones procedentes de los Estados Unidos a México ascendieron a 160 billones de dólares. Los empresarios mexicanos han realizado inversiones en los Estados Unidos por un monto de 14.8 billones de dólares durante el periodo de los 2008 al 2012. Asimismo, el 40% de los mexicanos piensa que Estados Unidos es el mejor modelo económico y 35% piensa que Norteamérica es la región más importante para México. Con todo este contexto, México y Estados Unidos necesitan una frontera consolidada en un marco de cooperación con instituciones activas que trabajen a favor de los países. Además necesitamos una frontera que responda a las necesidades de eficiencia que requiere este gran movimiento comercial y humano, porque también no hay que olvidar el lado humano eh, que es pues, la herramienta más importante de ambos países, que todos los días se lleva a cabo en esta región. Para ello es necesario fortalecer y ampliar los programas de confiabilidad para viajeros y cargamento, con el fin de que se realicen con prontitud precisamente aquellas actividades que favorecen nuestras economías. Yo creo que es una relación binacional que debe de ser de cooperación estratégica, de un intercambio que se da continuamente, que es todos los días de este intercambio comercial y que para ello quienes tenemos un espacio de representación debemos de colaborar con nuestros gobiernos para ver cómo, como es el caso que lo comenta la gobernadora Susana Martínez, cómo estas relaciones intersecretariales de esta colaboración de las dependencias entre el gobierno de Chihuahua y el gobierno de Nuevo México vienen realizando actividades en este intercambio que debe haber de cómo poder eh, tener una mayor penetración y siempre vigilando, por supuesto, el tema de seguridad, que es para ambos países. También en México se han visto casos muy lamentables que han pasado y de los cuales muchas veces nada más se habla de los mexicanos que quieren cruzar todos los días, pero no se hablan también de proyectos que se han quedado como el rápido y furioso, que nosotros como mexicanos hicimos exhortos como Senado de la República de que tenía que haber también una mayor colaboración del gobierno de Estados Unidos con México para este entendimiento que debe haber con ambas naciones. Thank you very much. We're, please send us your, your questions via Twitter. In just a moment we're going to open it up and grab, take some questions from the audience and, and others. Uh, but before we do that, I'd definitely like to hear from the commissioner. I mean, this is, your, this is sort of your full-time job, is building tomorrow's border, right? Managing it today and building it for the future. What, what's coming down the pike? What should we be looking for? So a couple of things. I mean, you know, it keeps me busy 15, 20 hours a week <laughs> sometimes. I mean, really. It's, it's really exhausting at, uh, in, in my declining years. And uh, uh, it's an incredible organization. Customs and Border Protection has 60,000 employees. We have 800 people overseas. We're in 40 countries. 
We have this dual mission of border security and our economic security. And we cover everything from counterfeit honey to capra beetles uh, to 60,000 plus children coming across uh, the Rio Grande Valley uh, uh, last year. Uh, it, the, the, the commitment and the dedication and the, and the quality of the personnel in that organization, uh, frankly, is unmatched. Uh, uh, they do, they do a, a, a marvelous job. The governor made a particularly interesting point that, again, besides the, the fact that a lot of people outside of the border don't really know or understand the border, is that the, we apprehend well over 100 different nationalities at the border. There is no greater number of, of Cubans coming into the United States under the Cuban Adjustment Act uh, at, at the Hidalgo Bridge than, than in any level across the, the water into, into Florida, et cetera. Uh, and people from every part, every part of the world uh, make that attempt, uh, either to claim asylum or, uh, or to, uh, in fact, uh, come into the country illegally. Uh, everything is based upon risk. There are those people, and, and I think uh, both members of Congress have talked about it, uh, what is a secure border. But there's a level, we do everything based upon risk. There's 60 plus thousand containers that come into this country every day at our ports of entry. We're not gonna open up 60,000 containers and search every one. There is rail cargo, as the governor said, there is truck cargo, and then there are lots of people. In fact, a million people every single day coming through our ports of entry legal crossers. And we have to make sure that they're people who aren't going to do us harm, people that aren't using false passports, or people that aren't imposters. It's an unbelievably complex job, and I think, uh, I, I think they do it uh, uh, in, incredibly well, and that story doesn't get told as, as uh, well. They work closely with the state and local. You brought that issue up. It is a, a tremendous partnership, whether it's with the Texas Department of Public Safety or whether it's with the sheriffs in New Mexico, and, uh, uh, and that level of cooperation and trust uh, and support for each other because quite frankly in places in New Mexico in uh, at, at two o'clock in the morning the only two people out there might be a deputy sheriff and someone from the United States Border Patrol and they need to understand and trust and support each other so those things are all all important I see I mean I've seen a lot of progress our wait times are down there is San Ysidro was mentioned in the earlier panel there is still a huge complaint though at San Ysidro and that is from the people that sell bottled water for people crossing and they say the lines move too quickly I can't sell the bottle well I can't sell the bottled water to anyone yeah it, and it tells you something about if you make the investment in the number of people that are needed if you make the investment in the infrastructure that's needed you can make a significant impact and improvement thank you Com Commissioner if I could You brought up the, the concept of, of, of risk and, and needing to be able to evaluate risk as a tool to do your job in an efficient way and just actually to just do your job because when you have so many containers, it's actually just impossible to, to sort of go into every one. So I know what, what you work on is you try to segment the risk out and identify lower risk traffic and higher risk traffic uh, and perhaps unknown level of risk traffic. Uh, you know, for, for thinking of the future, one of the things we hear about in, in really every field, not just border, is big data. Uh, using you know the masses of amounts of information that we're collecting as a tool to make better decisions how is it that that's working into CBP's strategy and ability to process uh, people in, in an efficient and secure way sure particularly for cargo that customs trade partnership against terrorism a company has vetted their supply chain they have vetted their personnel they have vetted their process they're still will submit to inspection and random inspection etc but they've gone to the extra trouble to to make sure that they're doing a good job they want the same things everyone in this room and everybody in government wants a safe and secure glo global supply chain uh, so that's particularly helpful. I think that, that you're going to see, uh, you know, particularly in the, in, in the future, this uh, uh, continuing analysis of big data. What was the country of origin? 
who is the shipper, what is the commodity, what is the manifest. If it's coming into the country, we get a manifest uh, 72 hours in advance. We have to be able to look at that. And then remember that we enforce laws, Customs and Border Protection enforces the laws for a mere 47 different federal agencies. 15 of those have what's called hold and release authority. So if it's pharmaceuticals coming in and the FDA says, gee, we need to hold this, but we're not available until next Monday because it's now Friday afternoon. That means it has to sit in a warehouse, often a refrigerated warehouse. We do a much better job now of working with our federal counterparts for us to be able to move in a direction to release that cargo and through the ACE, the single window, which many people are familiar with, you'll actually get to see the same information as a trader that we get to see. If it's being held up, you'll get to know why it's being held up and you'll get to know You'll, you'll find out what it takes for you to get that cargo released. And Chris, I want to add on to that. You know, ha having been in the intelligence community you know, during 9-11 and, and, and seeing how, how information sharing, intelligence sharing ha has evolved over, over the last 15 years, one important component that we're seeing a lot more of is, is getting local, and law, local law enforcement information into the hands of folks like many of the folks that, that, that work for Gill and, and right here in, in, in El Paso, what EPIC is doing um, to coordinating a lot of that has, has gone, has, has, we, we've gone leaps and bounds in sharing that information because big data doesn't mean anything unless you actually have access to it and have the analytical tools um, to make conclusions from it. Senator? Y yo celebro que la Oficina de Aduanas y Protección Fronteriza y el Sistema de Administración Tributaria están desarrollando este manifiesto aduanero que comenta, eh, unitario y compartido para el uso en ambos lados de la frontera para todos los medios de transporte. Esto es muy importante, son acuerdos que lograron los gobiernos entre México y Estados Unidos y también el manifiesto ferroviario que es un manifiesto de un carril individual con dirección norte, está operando en al menos cuatro de los siete cruces fronterizos, esperemos que a finales de este 2015 queden los siete cruces fronterizos ya para que se pueda agilizar también este traslado. So one of the questions we have is pushes us to a new topic, but is how do we have uh, border crossings that, that function well? And how do, essentially the question is how do we have increased trade but deal with the environmental consequences of the increased traffic? Uh, does anybody have thoughts on that? How can we, Congressman Rook? No, it was actually here at UTEP uh, that we began to quantify the impact to the environment and just to human health. I think about the CBP officers uh, who spend their working lives on these bridges. And so when cars and trucks are idling, they're breathing in those fumes. Um, those pollutants are then circulating in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso. Uh, the you know, environment knows no border. And so uh, the, the, the harmful pollutants that are generated by wait times are another way that we can measure um, the negative impact of the slowdown in cross-border traffic. And it just adds to the burden that uh, the commissioner has to facilitate that legitimate trade and travel uh, to the greatest extent possible. And where you have, uh, you know, local best practices or leadership or ideas uh, that can help to do that, uh, we must seize upon it. Uh, and where we can add to the 2,000 officers that were recently authorized and appropriated for, um, we're going to continue to pursue that. Senator Cornyn and I have introduced a bill to add an additional 5,000. Uh, and, and we need at least that many to do this, but then we need to use these uh, 24, 21st century solutions to, to some of these problems. But yes, there's a ver very real consequence um, to human life. And so I, I've been accused of far too often just looking at the numbers, the trade, the impact to the economy, the jobs, all those things are important. Uh, but so are people's lives, uh, whether it's the CBP officers at the bridge, those of us who are breathing the air, or on a day when it's 100 degrees in El Paso, and you're waiting on the Paso de Norte Bridge to come into uh, this community and spend your hard-earned dollars, and you're there 30, 40, 50 minutes in the hot sun, uh, that's a real toll that you're taking uh, on, on your life. And, and I don't know how elastic that demand to cross over into El Paso and spend money in this economy is. So whether we, we measure it and look at it from an economic dimension or a moral one, we've absolutely got to fix this, but we can quantify it at that level as well.